I'm going to share a little bit about some upcoming research that we're doing at Colorado State University that pertains to the role that estrogen might be playing in the pathophysiology and development of lipedema. So I just want to disclose that I am funded by the Lipedema Foundation for the research that you'll see suggested here. So it's been nicely covered today as far as the symptoms are pathophysiologic uh, pathophysiology associated with lipedema, and what we're focused on in particular in our lab is wanting to look at adipose tissue distribution, where we place our fat, and specifically looking at so the lower subcutaneous adipose tissue deposition, or lipodystrophy, where you're placing more fat in one area than another. And through research papers as well as patients, it's suggested with lipedema that this occurs at certain points, and that is puberty, oral contraceptive intake, pregnancy, or menopause. And very rarely you'll see it occur in males, and some research is suggesting it's due to decreases in testosterone. So this just sort of had our brains going that, could this be something that has to do with estrogen or estrogen regulation? So in exploring the role of estrogen, it's important to know that we have three forms. That is going to be estrone, estradiol, and estriol. And so we take this from more of the estradiol perspective, and that's because our studies in our laboratory started with looking at puberty and onset of puberty. And so here we have that the pituitary releases follicle-stimulating hormone and luteinizing hormone together then to produce estradiol from the ovaries in this case. So this estradiol, or E2, is going to be that active form during our reproductive years. Now I want to explain a little bit about adipose tissue, so this is supposed to be an adipose tissue or an adipocyte, and how estrogen signaling is working in this case. So we have the ER alpha receptor, we also have beta, but we came from the perspective of ER alpha first because of the way that estrogen interacts with it. So estrogen binds to this ER alpha receptor, and when it does this, studies from human subcutaneous adipose tissue, so that's that lower body fat, have demonstrated that ER alpha actually causes an increase in that GLUT4 transporter. So what does that mean? It means it allows that cell to take in more glucose or to store in more nutrients. This leads to an accumulation of lipid. So in this case, the ER alpha is saying women should deposit their fat in that lower body subcutaneous area, as we do when we go through puberty. In addition to this, studies further suggest that we have VEGF increased with estrogen connecting to ER alpha. This means that now we get all these nice blood vessels that bring more of this glucose to these glucose transporters that then have more lipid accumulation in the area of the lower body subcutaneous tissue. In addition to this, we have cell lines that are called 3T3 that have further demonstrated that things like P par gamma uh, are increased with estrogen alpha receptor. And this means that we're going to have an increase in adipogenesis. Adipogenesis is an increase in our fat cells. So now we have more nutrients, we have more vasculature, and we have more fat cells, meaning that we're going to place more of our fat here as women versus here. And so could this be what's causing this lipodystrophy or this fast accumulation here in the lower body? In addition to this, we have the accumulation side of adipose tissue, but there's an opposition side of lipolysis. So when you go to lose weight, your body's going through a lipolysis program of where we're burning that fat off. And we've looked into studies of does estrogen communicate, or estrogen receptors communicate with our adrenergic receptors, which are responsible for the programming of lipolysis? And this gives a nice cartoon of how, or what it is we know thus far, how these things connect. So at the top there in yellow, we have that ER alpha receptor. And the ER alpha receptor is connected to the alpha adrenergic receptor. And we're still trying to find out what's happening with the beta adrenergic receptor. But the alpha adrenergic receptor plays a role in inhibiting lipolysis. So as that one is going to go up, it's going to inhibit fat from being freed, versus the beta adrenergic is going to cause it to be revved up. And there are studies to definitely support that this is occurring. So as we have estradiol binding to that alpha adrenergic receptor, we're going to have an increase, or an increase in uh, adrenergic receptors. So as it's binding to the estrogen receptor, we're going to have an increase in those adrenergic receptors in this case. So now we're going to have lipolysis shunted through that alpha adrenergic receptor. And this is specifically in subcutaneous adipose tissue, and it's not in visceral. 
In addition to this, if we're comparing subcutaneous adipose tissue, lower, versus what we have in the abdominal cavity, we already have an increased expression of these alpha adrenergic receptors. So an increased expression plus estrogen coming in further increases it. Now we're driving towards more lipid accumulation in the lower body area. And again, that alpha adrenergic receptor is working this way because it inhibits lipolysis. Now on the other side, we're still trying to figure out what is the relation between beta adrenergic receptors in this case. And what we have thus far is it doesn't seem that the estrogen or estradiol plays a role in stimulating that aspect. So now we have talked about the receptors that are involved in fat accumulation, but fat goes so far beyond that as well. So that's one part of the equation, but we have that fat is also going to function as a reservoir. So if we think of hormones, we think of reproductive organs or our ovaries, but our fat is playing the exact same role. So what you see here is progesterone, testosterone, estradiol, estrone, all these hormones are capable of being produced with an adipose tissue. They can be signaled to that adipocyte or they can be signaled outside the body. So in this case, we're also questioning, is it something at the level of how those different hormones are functioning in that adipose tissue that then feeds back right to the est uh, estrogen receptors in this case? And so what we're doing within the laboratory right now, currently it's going, that we're looking at the enzymes that are involved between the conversions. We'll get to actually measuring the hormones, but we're looking at the enzymes between these to see if they're upregulated or downregulated so we can see if it's pushing towards a specific type of hormone or not. So this was suggested well before I got into this line of research in a 2014 publication that this could be estrogen related in this case. So questions that were proposed out there that are just now being uh, answered is, is there an alteration in that ER pattern? So it's not enough just to measure one estrogen receptor, it's important to measure the ratio of the two. So one could be up versus one being down, and could it be that this ratio is switched with lipidium adipose tissue? In addition to that, if it's not the ratio receptor, is it something that's downstream of that signaling pathway that might not be occurring correctly? Or that balance between lipolysis, so those adrenergic receptors, or that lipogenesis uh, that might be occurring with just estrogen binding to that estrogen receptor? These are all questions that we're trying to answer at Colorado State University. Now, in addition to this, uh, some of research talks have pointed out that there's issues with blood vessels as well as lymphatic vessels. And so this slide just sort of nicely sums up things that estrogen could be playing a role in, particularly with that VEGF. So it's going to be the growth of those vessels in this case. And so here, the overgrowth of these vessels could, uh, could occur with estrogen signaling. So the vessels and the blood vessels and the lymphatic vessels are within this adipose tissue that's releasing these hormones. So the adipose tissue is not the only one responding to it. It's the vessels within the adipose tissue as well that can now change the functionality of the vessels uh, embedded within. So some things that I think are important as researchers um, to think about in the field is when is it the correct time, if we're doing adipose tissue samples, for example, when is it the correct time to take these samples? Is it during a time where there's going to be that rapid accumulation of that body fat? So at the point of puberty, right at the point of pregnancy, or, or is it at the time of steady maintenance where you see that you're gaining weight a little bit slower? Or are those two times gonna be different? So it's important to differentiate when those samples are taken and also investigate what the difference between those two time points may be. Uh, so my contact information is listed here. I want to thank the Lipedema Foundation, also Dr. Herps, as well as the lab at Tulane that's given samples to, uh, for us to evaluate uh, the protein expression of what's occurring in Lipedema adipose tissue samples. Thank you.